I knew that there had been kind of an embedded special um, FBI team that was you know, communicating regularly with, with Twitter, shaping some of their content decisions, kind of nudging them towards censorship of, of various accounts. I just didn't understand the volume. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall for The Spectator. Today I'm joined in London by Lee Fang. Lee is an independent journalist who, until March 2023, was at the American left-wing media group The Intercept and uh, has since gone independent but was also uh, one of the leading journalists on the Twitter files at the end of 2022, part of the team that went in with Michael Schellenberger, Barry Weiss and Matt Tybee into Twitter HQ upon Elon Musk's invitation, but also uh, one of the very few journalists to report on Antifa, certainly maybe the only left-wing journalist to report on Antifa, if I can call you uh, left-wing. But anyway, there's much to get into. Lee, thank you for joining me today. Winston, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Um, So you're in London for the the event with Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi, the uh, censorship industrial complex exposed which uh, i look forward to getting into because you've been a big part of exposing that and um that's not least with your twitter files coverage but one of the the things that's striking about reading your story is the censoriousness within journalism and if i can if i can start if you don't mind which i i think might be mildly traumatic or maybe more maybe not the um incident from the 2nd of June 2020, the height of the BLM uh, movement, you're in Oakland reporting, capturing video uh, interviews with protesters and others, and you capture this interview with a black man called Max, who says, why does a black life matter only when a white man takes it? And he had critiques of the BLM movement despite supporting it. You published that video and, and your world sort of seemed to cave in. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, you know, it's hard to kind of place yourself in that moment because that moment is very unique. That was perhaps the height of racial anger in the United States, at least since the 60s, you know? And in that moment, it was chaotic coming out of lockdowns. Um, You know, this was Trump presidency. Um, This was only a few days after the first initial riots in Minneapolis that then spawned uh, kind of copycat protests and riots or uprisings, whatever you want to call them, in dozens of cities all across the United States. In the San Francisco Bay Area where I live, there were massive protests and riots in Oakland and San Francisco, uh, but also uh, mass looting and violence in many of the suburbs and surrounding communities. And you know, I had gone to several uh, protests and riots and kind of witnessed and reported and tweeted um, in this particular community. This is just outside of Oakland. Um, there had been kind of opportunistic looting. Um, the police in this small community outside of Oakland were deployed to the bigger cities of San Francisco and Oakland. And in this moment where there were no police, uh, people, uh, I don't know if they're protesters, I don't think we know exactly who they were, but they looted the main shopping mall, they looted um, the auto dealership, 80 cars were stolen, many of the cars were like driven into buildings, and it was just mass chaos. I was trying to make sense of it. I was walking around um, with a friend of mine, interviewing different community residents and activists, Uh, And, you know, just I was asking the same question to everyone. Do you have anything you want to get off your chest? You know, this was a moment for expression. And as I was walking back to my car, a young man followed me and said, hey, are you with the media? I have something I want to talk about. And I was like, "Okay." And I talked to him for a minute. And he was, you know, just very interesting. He, He wanted to share his internal contradictions. He was a supporter of Black Lives Matter. But he said that Two of his cousins were murdered uh, in East Oakland, more impoverished, working class part of Oakland. And they were not killed by police, not killed by a white person. And he had to wonder, he said, you know, uh, no, none of these people, none of these protesters, there was no media, no one seemed to care about my family. Mm. But it doesn't change the, the tragedy, just as George Floyd's mother grieves for him, his aunt grieves for his two cousins. 
but the po- political dynamic is completely different. Why does his, why do the, the the lives of his cousins seem to matter less um, than others? Does it only matter with a racial contrast? That it's a, if it's a white person, if it's a politicized context, like a, a, a police officer taking the life, doesn't matter. You know, out of speaking to people all day at the protests. You know, I thought his remarks were the most interesting. He made it very clear that he was a supporter of Black Lives Matter. He simply said he wanted it to be a more broad, beautiful movement mm. that takes into account all the different ways that black lives are taken in the United States. Why do you think that that's such a controversial... Why was that so controversial for him to, to say that? It's not controversial outside of the media, outside of academia, outside of the, ac- the activist community. In this, you know, just a month later in southeast Washington, D.C., there was a protest for more policing, um, you know, coming out of uh, a senseless murder of a child. Um, and, you know, there, there are communities ravished by violent crime, by gang violence, uh, and there's a robust demand for public safety, for law enforcement, for solutions uh, for crime. Um, but there's kind of a pathological sense within certain subsets of the media, of, of, of academia and the activist class uh, that kind of view these issues through a black and white lens that uh, police are descendants of slave catchers. You know, that's where they kind of originated from, which is not true. Um, that police are the source of all violence in, in America, that they're the vanguard of capitalism and uh, if we just do away with police, if we abolish police, if we defund police, you know, all the problems in America will evaporate. Um, it's, it's kind of, um, it's an extreme dogmatic view, but it, it, and it's always kind of percolated around the fringes of, of media. But in this moment of 2020, it burst onto the mainstream. It burst into the corporate boardrooms and into mainstream media outlets. Um, it's so pe- peculiar is that it would burst into journalism. Journalists' responsibility is to report the news. And, and I recall, although I, I can't for the, the top of my head remember, who published the article in defense of looting. And then there was the famous um, uh, re- uh, video report uh, broadcast of someone reporting with fires in the background saying mostly peaceful <laughs> okay. protests. Yeah. So what was going on within journalism? Like the, ignoring the rest of society, why... With, if their responsibility is to simply report the news, why was there sort of an activist well, I mean, uh, slant to it? I think there's a, a, a very complicated, long answer to this, but the succinct version is that, you know, we've had a collapse in ordinary journalism over 20 years. Um, the advertising revenue that funded most newspapers and dailies um, went to Google and Facebook. So, you know, where I'm from, in Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, you had these big regional newspapers that had a metro desk that covered crime, that covered everyday lives of people. They were all laid off, you know, or mostly laid off um, because of this loss of revenue. You have the only journalism jobs available at these kind of clickbaity online outlets. It's now not seen as a, you know, journalism used to be a working class, middle class job um, with a very diverse kind of background uh, going into it. Now it's an elite prestige job. If you, you're more likely to see people who came from a very privileged background who are really not connected to the, the lives of normal Americans. You know, it, the only way you can really afford being a journalist, I've been very lucky, um, but for many people uh, going into journalism, they've kind of had to rely on their parents or some other kind of cushion of wealth to afford these kind of very low paid jobs. Um, and so you've had this kind of bifurcated media where uh, people, where journalism used to have a, a, a very varied socioeconomically diverse background. Now it's really just the, the top echelons of society so going to the these jobs. why the top echelons then not taking that, whoever it is, why wouldn't they take the responsibility uh, seriously to report the news rather than to report, you know, in, in a kind of bi- completely biased way? I mean, there's always bias. They view a lot of these debates around violence, around politics, around inequality, around American society through an abstract lens, I suppose. Um, A lot of them haven't talked to people who are most affected by violence in society. You know, in the United States, it depends on the year, but it kind of ranges between something like 16,000 to 18,000 homicides per year. Mm. Um, Most of these are not connected to 
what you see in the news. I mean, journalists know what gets clicks are school shootings and police shootings, but this is a tiny, tiny, you know, percent of a percent um, uh, number of the homicides in America. Most of them um, come from, you know, domestic mm-hmm. disputes, gangs, um, cycles of, of, of violence and very impoverished communities. And it, there's really no political angle to them. I mean, this is what happens every night in America. I, I don't know when this will broadcast, but just kind of look at the major news media in St. Louis or Cleveland or Chicago and, you know, why people are getting killed in America. It's, it's not, you know, um, political extremists or cops or whomever most of the ca- those, these cases. It's just regular people kind of enacting these cycles of violence. Um, but for the journalists who occupy very powerful positions in national media and left-wing media, uh, these stories are too morally complex. They want the simplistic one-dimensional story of evil racist cops killing people. Um, There's also just coming out of the the Trump, the tail end of the Trump administration, um, this huge demand for kind of activist media that uh, is going to have, you know, you're going to have the story that finally takes down the Trump administration that, you know, takes down one of his policies. So there's, there had been kind of a buildup of, um, kind of, uh, political style reporting, uh, all going into 2020. Mm. And for, you know, I think for, for the average person, they were being misinformed in a lot of these debates. I mean, this is when they were being told about what's, you know, there, there's been, there, there was a gigantic demand suddenly for, uh, journalism that represented, the African American community, for people of color, um, t- reporting about uh, police violence and, and and violence in general, uh, but for a lot of these reporters, they didn't talk to normal working class, middle class African Americans. Polls consistently showed, even in um, the the immediate aftermath of the George Floyd killing, that something like seventy or eighty percent of African Americans in this country, in the United States. Uh, want current levels or higher levels of policing. Hmm. Um, that's consistent am- among polls. Um, you know, no one wants police brutality and people support reform. But this idea of abolishing the police, um, defunding the police, uh, it came from an extreme elite in America and then it kind of filtered down through the media and activist class. It never represented the actual opinions of um, normal Americans. Uh, and I think that's what really conflicted people and that led to the uh, backlash against this very um, ordinary interview that I conducted. Um, it, it conflicted with this activist image. Mm. It punctured this image. Um, and uh, it angered a lot of people. I, I've, you know, After I posted this video, I trended nationally for a, a day and a half, uh, almost two days, uh, as a racist. Um, I had colleagues who accused me of being racist for posting this interview. Um, you know, I had people threatening to punch me, to protest outside of my home. Uh, you know, I just, it was just a flood of hate. Um, and at, at the kind of height of racial anger in America, uh, it felt like the walls were kind of closing in because, you know, it's like this was a unique moment in, in history. And, and, and four, or two days later, you issued an apology. Yeah, you know, to be honest with you, and this is a little bit uncomfortable to talk about, but I, I couldn't sleep those two days. You know, I just looking at my phone, seeing the emails, ping every few seconds with hate messages, with death threats, with, you know, people calling you a racist, which and in many ways is much worse than a death threat because you know people online will make empty threats, but being vilified mm. as a racist is. Um, makes you unemployable in Mm. kind of any intellectual job. Mm. Um, Mm. You can't really work anywhere if you're seen as as a racist. So, you know, I was horrified. And it's also like this kind of internal um, contortions that I was engaging in because I was like, you know, I've kind of dedicated my life to reporting on issues around organized bigotry and and discrimination. And here I am now vilified as Mm. the country's top racist, you know, at least for that moment in time. Mm. Um, It was very painful. And yeah, and the, the, also the lack of solidarity. You know, I've been, a, I think, a team player at The Intercept. I was there since the relaunch in 2015. Um, I've helped mentor my colleagues, so help them with stories. I'm very supportive of them and, and their journalism. And then for to see 
uh, half or not more than half of them engage in this kind of public mob accusing me of racism, almost all of them without ever talking to me once, just kind of seeing me trend as a racist and then agreeing that I'm a racist and, and, and retweeting and, and promoting these attacks. It was like, wow, I mean, when you're part of an organization, any institution, but, you know, a, a medium, small size journalism outlet, it's very intimate. You know, we're all working together on I'm a daily basis. I'm surprised to hear that because of, of Glenn Greenwald's history. He's he's someone who, who I consider has great integrity. And so... Yeah, and Glenn was not part of the public he accusation. Wasn't. Absolutely not. No, he, you know, um, you know, privately very supportive of me. And there were quite a few reporters and editors who were privately very supportive. But publicly... Um, they, they came out publicly and no, but publicly many of the other re- reporters and copy editors and some of the editors were condemning me. It's so astonishing because if you look, you're not even speaking. You're just asking a guy questions. Yeah. My question was, do you have anything you want to get off your chest? Yeah. And so that's enough to be deemed a racist. Um, uh, so when you publish the apology, it sort of sounds like you're under tremendous stress and duress. Yeah, I mean, I had kind of received a message from the editorial leadership that I had violated certain guidelines and I was under other pressure to apologize. And, you know, I, I felt like it was the right thing to do to salvage my career at the moment. Uh, so I did post this fairly long apology mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where I, I, you know, I apologized for um, any ins- insensitivity uh, during this moment, but also kind of backed up my my belief that, you know, um, you can't have criminal justice reform without um, hand in hand reducing violence in society. Otherwise, you're going to lead to backlash. So that acknowledging that um, African Americans do face disproportionate level of certain forms of uh, uh, police discrimination, especially non-lethal policing. I think the the evidence is very clear that uh, African Americans receive a higher degree of traffic stops um, than other racial groups. Um, you know, I, I have your your viewers can read my whole apology. It's still online. Well, the thing that's most like uh, striking about it is that you're apologizing for how your reporting made others feel. In fact, whose feelings I harmed is, a, is that <laughs> thing yeah. you apologize for. Do you think journalists need to be sensitive about the truth in how they present it? No, but they do need to be sensitive. In the way they communicate, every the reason you are a reporter is that you choose your words carefully and you pick context, you create context for every fact you present. Um, so a certain level of sensitivity is important. But um, you know, I do regret certain aspects, or maybe even the entire apology. I'm still kind of working through this um, personally um, because you know I've, I've I've written probably over two thousand stories in the last 15 years of, mm. as a journalist, I'm less proud of a few. Maybe I should apologize for the few pieces that I'm, <laughs> I'm less proud of. I didn't. I don't think actually my interview with Max uh, quite deserves an apology. I, I didn't actually harm anyone with that interview. Mm. So if, I mean, you, if anything, it's it, it, you're broadening the, the conversation. No, and Max, is- Max, you know, the young man that I interviewed, he looked me up after seeing my cancellation happen and um, rapid motion and he called me and he said this is this is crazy I think you're being bullied because of your race um, you know I, do you I, think he's right about that do you think you're bullied for your race you know in this moment he's uh, he, he made the point to me that if you were African American this wouldn't have happened this is happening because you're not mm. and I think he's probably right about that there was kind of a racial dynamic to it um, although you're not a white cis male sure but like you know in the politics of race um especially asian americans they kind of lose their poc card the second they say something that's perceived as conservative or moderate mm. um doesn't ever i think even black people do sure well. exactly right. um I th- it's very cute for asian americans but it absolutely applies to any minority mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so look earlier in this conversation you said that there's uh, the elite echelons of American society are going into, into journalism. And I noticed through that period that liberal media was not talking, uh, firstly, some of these other dynamics to the, to the race relations in America, but also when it came to Antifa and far-left extremism, you had that they were almost completely ignoring it. And um, yet you 
were, were covering it. Why were you the only one from the left covering it? Well, broadly speaking, I'm interested in violence in society. I mean, just to have a civilization, to have a society, I believe, and this is perhaps my bias, uh, we can't engage in political debate with a, a violent, you know, dynamic. Um, that's how hmm. violence unravels in society. Once we kind of destroy our norms around public discourse, um, we see violence ratchet up and we, we can't really solve any big public policy or political phenomenon if uh, one side or both sides start resor resorting to violence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very dangerous for societies. You look around the world and where violence has unraveled, uh, it leads to some very bad things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I've, I've written about right-wing violence uh, for a very long time. And, you know, just as in terms of my, my principles around nonviolence, um, I, I apply this to the far left as well. You know, back in 2017, after Trump's election, we saw this explosion in political violence. Uh, both left and right groups, although the tendency was usually left-wing groups, um, going into these street battles and fighting each other. That's, by the way, a point of contention, I think. There's a, a long debate about who's worse. The right, even if some people accept that there's left-wing violence, they'll say, but their right-wing violence is much worse. Are you suggesting that actually it, the tendency was that the violence came more from the left than from the right? Absolutely. And, and this is in a post-Charlottesville era. Yeah, and even the Charlottesville thing is interesting. You know, um, I mean, actually, in full disclosure, I mean, I, I grew up kind of in the punk music scene in the Washington, D.C. area, going to, you know, anti-war protests at the outside of the Iraq War and War on Terror. You know, living near D.C., there's always a protest to go to. Mm. And uh, I was kind of part of a punk kind of, you know, organization that was essentially the same as Antifa, same style, whatever. And, you know... What were they called? Uh, Anti-racist action. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if they're still around. This is a long time ago. This uh -huh. is when I was an adolescent. And um, at the time, uh, I think in, I believe, I, in, I think it was 2002, uh, there was a large protest of white supremacists who came to Washington, D.C. to kind of march around and wave flags and be provocative. You know, I, just a few years ago, I went back and looked at the news clips, and this is in another era of the United States. You know, not that long ago, there was kind of a norm that when neo-Nazis or the Klan came to protest, there was more or less a media blackout. Like, these people are here to just to agitate, to gain attention. So let's ignore them. So let's ignore them. Take the oxygen away from them. Um, and that was generally the case for this uh, protest, this neo-Nazi protest in D.C., and, you know, I was... Uh, you know, very young and uh, went with some friends and, you know, people went and threw rocks and tried to fight them and, you know, did the kind of Antifa thing. And it was exhilarating as a, I don't know, 14, well, 14, 13, could, 14 year old, yeah. but um, I, I wasn't very politically developed at the time, not very mature. And what's interesting here is that tiny group of Antifa, tiny group of neo-Nazis, but still like maybe 600. I think that's, that's what the official tally was at the time. But no media, major media coverage. No one seriously harmed. They came to D.C. They left. They dispersed. Nothing happened. When Charlottesville happened, it was essentially the same number of people. 600 Nazis coming for attention, coming to provoke people. But instead of it being a media blackout, instead of just a small protest contingent that came and, you know, rabble-roused and left, you had hundreds if not thousands of counter-protesters. You had hundreds of reporters. You had this, like gigantic spectacle that then became much more violent you know like this and for the exact same problem 600 you're in a country of 320 million million people you're always going to have some kind of extremist group mm -hmm. um you're never going to rid yourself of a, of a of a group of 600 you know extremists the question is how to deal with them and uh for the 2002 uh response of basically ignoring them, having a small group of protesters, and then that's it. Versus the 2017 um, Charlottesville massive response, did that really help anyone? Did it, did it actually tone down the violence, or did it increase the level of violence? You know, so many brawls in the street. Uh, Heather Heyer, one of the left-wing protesters, killed. Um, you know, many different kind of clashes all around the country in relation to this. Even where uh, I, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, there were then 
brawls on the street that were in reaction to Charlottesville. It's just, it's just like once you kind of unspool violence in society, like we were talking about earlier, it's hard to put it back in the... There's a couple of in- inconsistencies here, about, if, I, if I may, because earlier you say you're interested in violence and, and re- reporting it. Yeah. You, you're not suggesting that ignoring it is the correct thing to do. One, as a journalist, should report it. I right? think just place it in context. Like if you look at the um, reporting around the 2002 event, it's like a couple... It's 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 a small item in the Washington Post. It's a small item in the Wash, Washington Examiner. Or, you know some of the smaller newspapers. It's not this massive head. You know in CNN, it's all day. You know uh, Fox News, it's all day. MSNBC, it's it's all month <laughs> cover, covering this news. And you know the protesters saying, you know this is this is Hitler on the march. If we don't fight fight them in the street the parking lot here, we've mm. got to fight them at the grocery store. <laughs> we've got to fight mm. them in our community. It's just, it's like, let's just remember, we're, we've always, in the United States, we're, we've always had a small group of extremists of every type. There are black nationalists that are violent. There are white nationalists that are violent. There are, you know, the, you know, nation of Islam people that are, that are extreme. Do we need to go fight all these people in the street and, and pretend that they are on the verge of taking over this country? Like, I just, I, you gotta, as a journalist, place it in context. The other thing I don't, quite follow is that you also said there's more left-wing violence now earlier but both examples you give of 2002 and 2017 were where there was it was started by the neo-nazis so is it always the, it's that doesn't sort of suggest to me that there are more left-wing or at least they're working it certainly fluctuates right like the trump election people lost their minds and thought that political violence uh was the only appropriate response I don't, you know, I remember 2009 after the Obama election, there was not a lot of um, left-wing violence, um, but the left reacted violently to Trump in a lot of ways. Uh, this didn't exist not that long ago, hmm. um, but it, it would be, I think, uh, wrong not to identify it. You know, the, there are Antifa protests, beating up journalists, uh, attacking counter-protesters, attacking even innocent bystanders especially on the West Coast in cities like Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, uh, that were predominantly left-wing, you know, just to call a spade a spade. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't right-wing violence. I mean, certainly that, that w- that's been a dynamic as There's well. A, the, one of the things that I see right-wingers saying is that when there are neo-Nazis together, that it's actually fed dressed up. Do you think that they're wrong about that? Do you think that there's... Uh, that there are that, that the right wing don't take seriously enough far right extremism. I mean, I I was I and mean, we we're talking about my mega cancellation. I got many canceled in 2017 for making this point. Look at the history of the FBI. Um, they go into political organizations on both the left and the right, and they agitate and they encourage violence and they entrap people uh, and, and arrest them. Um, Yes, the Proud Boys have FBI informants. Many of these alt-right and conservative groups are filled with police, local police and FBI informants. And many of these Antifa groups have FBI informants and police informants. You know, um, there's been quite a lot of reporting that some of the Denver chapters of uh, Antifa organizations that were encouraging people to buy, buy guns to go out and engage in violence, these were cops that were dressed up in handkerchiefs and <laughs> whatnot, you know, um... And we've got like a very long uh, history of this kind of police agitation. And, you know, I, I just just pointing out to the left to say, hey, look, if you're if you're if you're engaged in this kind of far left activism, although I'm not even sure if that's the right term for it, just be aware that if someone's encouraging you to engage in violence, mm. uh, maybe be a little bit skeptical. Yeah, Do, uh, th- that carried on as well into Jan 6. And there's still a lot of uh, speculation and perhaps conspiracy about those sort of infiltrations in Jan 6. Did you cover Jan 6? You know what? I, I, I followed it very closely. I wrote very little. Um, I, I, you know, it's still one of the one of the most fascinating moments in, in American history for a lot of reasons um, in terms of just escalating, speaking of the FBI's powers, um, I think very scary. Um, a lot of kind of questions still linger on the role of uh potential role of FBI informants. We, we know many were in the crowd, um, or many were uh, members of these organizations that participated in January 6th. Uh, 
apparently some of these uh, security videos are, are going to be disseminated by the new Republican majority in the House to be kind of more closely examined. A lot of questions remain. Mm -hmm. So since all of that, uh, you have, you, you cover, uh, you, you're invited, as I said earlier, into Twitter HQ. This is this is forwarding uh, 2000, so the, uh, 2020, end of 2022. Um, I want to ask about your specific reporting from there. But b before that, um, what was that experience like as a journalist? Was that an exciting thing to walk into? Or did you feel like this was a big story like about to happen? or what, what, And did you meet Elon, who you were with Michael and, and Barry and Matt? What, tell, t tell me what happened. Well, it's, it's strange. It was weird. It was it was exhilarating. It was exciting, but also just weird. <laughs> I mean, I've, you know, I've reported on, I don't, I have never quantified it, but probably dozens of leaked, hacked, and other kind of, you know, documents that were not intentionally released by powerful corporations, from billionaires, from governments all over the world. Mm. I've reported on documents allegedly hacked by the Algerian government, by the Qatari government, by the Russian government. Documents leaked from major banks, from defense contractors, from surveillance firms. Um, you know, I've, I've done these kind of, uh, you know, inside document stories so many times in my career, but I've never gone to a source where the CEO actually invites you in and says, hey, look at all of our kind of most hidden secrets of this very powerful uh, company and please publish them as, as quickly as possible. I mean, it was just... I mean, it's it still kind of doesn't make sense to me, but I, it, it was very exciting. So, what you you were in? Did you have an engineer with you going through the computers and and sort of? There was never a kind of um, regular process, and I joined a little bit after Tybee, um, Barry Weiss, and others had had gotten started on this, and I only went in for about four days. Um, but yeah, I, I went in, and there was a lawyer and a an engineer. Um, who was kind of assigned to help us, we would kind of write different queries uh, for searching the various tools and emails and databases of, of Twitter, and that lawyer would then conduct those searches and then show us the results. So did you have an idea of what you wanted to find? How, how did you start that? Yeah, process? you know, I, I'm a, I, was, I'm, I, I wrote a big feature piece before uh, Elon bought Twitter back in October 2022 about social media censorship from the Department of Homeland Security. A lot of the same emails, but just I obtained them a different way. Hmm. Uh, the Missouri Attorney General had sued the Department of Homeland Security and through the litigation process, a lot of emails had been produced. I was also talking to a whistleblower from the Department of Homeland Security. So I had already been on this beat. Hmm. So I was interested in the kind of big government censorship story that Taibbi and Schellenberger and others were reporting. But I went in there hoping, you know, I'm like, okay, this story on government censorship and attempts at shaping the public conversation around the 2020 election and COVID and others, um, it's, they're kind of already dominating that, that side of the of the story. I wanted to do something different. Um, I've, I just, as, in terms of my own style as a journalist, I always have like, you know, 15 stories half finished and then I just need to push <laughs> to get them done. And yeah. I had started a story actually earlier that year about uh, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, had worked with uh, various contractors and social media companies to do exactly what um, you know we've alleged that Russia and Ar Iran and China do to the U.S., which is create fake identities on social media to manipulate the pol the domestic political debate. In those countries or in Mer in America. Well, what those countries do to America, we do back to them. Sure, and that and that piece has never really been fully explored and reported. Um, there had been a report that kind of um, identified some aspects of this. I, through a source, found um, a contractor who who worked uh, for the military uh, for this project in the past. I conducted an interview with him. I had gathered a little bit of evidence, but I just didn't get that story over the finish line. And here I am in Twitter headquarters where I'm wondering, okay, if, if the Pentagon is working with Twitter and Facebook to create fake identities to manipulate uh, the debate around Iran and um, in, in areas where the, the Pentagon has kind of a focus, hopefully there's something there. And I found more than I could have imagined. Um, just looking at the Twitter emails, I found that back 
in 2017, you know, the, the Pentagon had this network of fake identities um, in Yemen, in Syria, uh, in Iraq, Arab language accounts that they took covert, that they removed any kind of identification with the Pentagon. They gave them new names and new kind of monikers that they're just, you know, a regular person living by the Euphrates or, or something. And uh, they asked Twitter secretly, um, we've got this network of propaganda accounts. Uh, can you help us boost them? And so, you know, back in the day when you received a verified blue check, it, re it gave you a, a, a variety of benefits. You couldn't be blacklisted. You were more likely to trend. Um, uh, you were more, just more visible on the timeline. The t Twitter engineered a special verification check mark for the Pentagon's uh, Arab language propaganda accounts but without the blue check. So it was an invisible blue check that, get, that conferred the same benefits. Mm. Um, they later classified this whole project, but worked with Twitter, worked with Facebook, and then created fake news portals, basically to you know, project the Pentagon's message on you know, the war in Yemen, uh, the war in, in Syria, uh, promoting uh, you know, stories that were damaging to US adversaries like Iran, like there's a story that they promoted using these accounts claiming that uh, Iran was taking Afghan refugees and harvesting their organs. You know, these kind of salacious stories that, uh, you know, are used to basically destabilize and harm our U.S. adversaries in the region. Um, and it's just fascinating to me because as Twitter was providing this white glove uh, service uh, to the Pentagon and their propaganda, their secret propaganda accounts, Twitter was going to Congress uh, going to the American media and saying, we are absolutely against any state-backed information operation, any propaganda effort. We will identify any government-funded propaganda effort. We will shut it down, and we will disclose it on our website. All the while, um, they were assisting the U.S. military with their own uh, state-backed propaganda effort. Inconsistent as they're being, it's not that surprising to me that the America would have disinformation is used as a means it's a, as a, a way to fight international wars what's what was more shocking from the twitter files generally is that that was being used against the american people or rather there was that there was an interplay between big tech and intelligence services and big government to censor and propagate disinformation on the american people themselves well you know there's there's been long standing law that's now been kind of chiseled away in the us that um, the CIA, the military can engage in various, you know, underhanded propaganda overseas, but it's, it, there's a red line in terms of influencing uh, U.S. audiences. The Internet destroys that red line. You know, anything that we do overseas to shape, you know, various conflicts and adversaries, Americans can see that as well. Um, so any of these kind of post-war restrictions on American propaganda uh, basically don't exist. And yeah, I mean, and just in terms of these other broader debates, uh, I mean, I was fascinated looking at the Twitter files. I knew that there had been kind of an embedded special um, FBI team that was you know, communicating regularly with, with Twitter, shaping some of their content decisions, kind of nudging them towards censorship of, of various accounts. I just didn't understand the volume. I mean, I'm looking at these emails of major Twitter executives. They're getting emails almost every other day from FBI and Department of Homeland Security officials. Hmm. I mean, I, I just I can't imagine being at a major media company or a social media company with that level of pressure from the national security state. Hmm. I mean, that just I mean, regardless of the actual details of, of, of each uh, request, that level of persistence and constant pressure um, that, that was that took me aback. Hmm. So, uh, as well as the PSYOP story, uh, you also did a piece about how the pharmaceutical industry lobbied social media to shape content around vaccine policy. Yeah, that's Could right. Um, there was a huge demand to shape COVID discourse. Um, I think f for everyone in the public, and media and the public, it was a question of, a, of a, the black box. Wh where are these decisions coming from? We could see that these you know, stories questioning the lab leak theory, uh, questioning lockdowns seem to not ever trend on Twitter or, you know, on Facebook, they would get deleted. Um, there was, it was clearly, a, there was clearly a lot of censorship looking from the outside, but to actually look from the inside, 
we got a better picture. Um, uh, one of the organizations that was instructing Twitter on which accounts uh, to censor on various uh, COVID content stories, uh, including criticism of lockdowns, uh, including questions around the vaccine um, efficacy, um, uh, came from this organization, uh, Public Good uh, Projects. Uh, this was an organization that was fully funded by the vaccine makers, um, the biotech innovation organization. That's the lobby group that represents Moderna and Pfizer. Mm. Uh, they provided a special grant to these disinformation researchers. They organize, organized this, this project and they had backdoor access telling Twitter they would send a weekly update of which Twitter accounts should be censored, which of them should be uh, shadow banned, mm. including some very major accounts like uh, Zero Hedge. So Big Pharma were telling social media to censor specific people about the vaccine. That's right. And um, wow. they just used a, a, a third party conduit, completely funded by Big Pharma. Through public good projects. Yes. Um, funneling the money to them. And then their, their workers, their employees would send a list every week to to Twitter saying, hmm. here's what you should censor. Wow. And and only uh, last week, Schellenberger and Taibbi released the, the, the um, report that they have evidence that patients zero were indeed from the Wuhan lab funded by Fauci, uh, and they were doing gain of function research. In, and all of these stories, they were people who even suggested it were told that they were conspiracy theorists. And um, those stories were, were shut down. It's uh, that censorship through COVID has been absolutely astonishing. Yeah, I mean, this is what kind of annihilates, I think, a lot of the credibility of the disinformation industry, as it were. Mm. And uh, for a lot of media outlets and social media platforms that perhaps the biggest story of the century so far, um, or at least the last 10 years, uh, was, I mean, it's looking more and more likely that COVID did come from a lab. But you were branded as a conspiracy theorist or a racist for reporting the truth. Hmm. One of your other stories on censorship is actually a story about your former employer, uh, Pierre Omidyar. Uh, so you, uh, this month, published an article sh uh, arguing or, or, or reporting that um, he financed the, the, the um, public-private partnership to censor election-related Twitter and Facebook post. What can you tell me about that story? Well, you know, I've been doing these ongoing stories about the kind of bureaucracy around censorship. How does it actually work? What are they going after? And what's the role of the federal government? I'm just I'm super interested in how the Department of Homeland Security has kind of had mission creep. It was created to stop another 9-11. And now they're somehow involved in telling Twitter and Facebook, what to do, mm. <laughs> or nudging them uh, w on, on which pieces of content to take yeah. down. I mean, this this incredible growth of, of the bureaucracy is fascinating to me, and it raises constitutional issues, it, it raises basic fairness issues, and and, and and civil liberties questions. But also, just looking at how this works, and I've, I've been filing um, record requests with some of the academics who have been advising the government um, on these censorship efforts. And uh, I got some of the records back, and it, one of the records is a report from a contractor, uh, Center for Internet Security, that set up this misinformation reporting portal. And this is the, the kind of infrastructure used by various NGOs, the Democratic Party and others, to report you know, examples of alleged misinformation uh, to the government, and the government would forward them on um, to Twitter or Facebook, this kind of reporting portal, though, you know, th th this kind of censorship issue, it raises two issues. One, is this even constitutional? Should the government have any role? But I think if, if you kind of made the Isn't case... Isn't that a clear no? With, with the Bill of but Rights? But let's, let's, take, let's take it... Let's, let's, for the sake of argument, and I'm, I'm sympathetic that it's a clear no, but let's say, for the sake of argument, that perhaps the misinformation reporting world uh, can make a constitutional case that the government should be involved. I think the clear second question after that, if you take them at their word, is is it being done fairly? Are, are, are the various stakeholders in society, and if you're engaging in misreporting, misinformation reporting around election, are both political parties being represented? 
or all the political parties being represented. Because if, if, in the most delicate time for any type of um, you know, public discourse is right before an election. I think we can all agree on that. And I think the clear question to the second question, or the clear answer to the second question is no, because what I found in this story is that the, even the infrastructure that was created to censor tweets around the 2020 election was funded by one of the largest Joe Biden donors in the country, and that's Pierre Midiar. Mm. Uh, he donated, donated $45 million to various organizations that helped uh, elect Joe Biden while partnering uh, and, and fully funding uh, this organization that helped take down mostly conservative tweets. Um, and so, and sorry, if I wasn't clear, he's the, the, the financial backer of The Intercept, yeah. uh, your former uh, media company that you left this year. But also, and I think this is w w in understanding the, uh, what is being called the censorship industrial complex, the web, the complex web that it is, is that it's also coming, it's, a, it's the public-private interplay. It's not just these institutions. It's not just the media, as we've discussed. It's not just intelligence and government and social media, but there's uh, pub, uh, the private sphere as well are acting. Uh, inter there's an interplay between all of them, and it's probably generally quite popular amongst about half the population. Yeah, I, and it's, it's become just such a a partisan issue. It's suddenly popular with many Democrats, mm. um, even though free speech has traditionally been associated with the left. Um, that has flipped, but you know that's right. Even with Pierre Midiar. Um, I think a lot of what he's funded as a philanthropist um, is generally laudable. You know, he works on um, many different issues, and I, you know, I don't want to uh, criticize everything he's done. But in this particular case, it, it just seems strange to me because when he founded, when he helped found the Intercept, he you know endowed it with a certain amount of money. Um, he did it under an umbrella company called First Look uh, Media, and under that First Look, First Look, and. First look was um, a kind of wink to the First Amendment because he said he he's so concerned with free speech and a free society where the you know he was inspired by the Edward Snowden uh, you know leaks or disclosure sure. of you know mass surveillance of Americans that you know the government is wor was working and still working with the phone companies with the uh, various internet companies to collect basically every interaction uh, at least the metadata. Um, and, and in addition to other uh, interactions. And he was appalled at that, and that was part of the reason that he funded The Intercept. Here we are, um, nine years later after those, or ten years later after those disclosures, he's now funding, uh, you know, nonprofits and contractors that work with the government that engage in censorship. Do you I think mean, he sees the irony in that? That's a good question. I mean, if I had a moment with him, that'd be my first topic to discuss as it would be mine uh so you mentioned um the that from 9 11 that so some of this started with the surveillance of 9 11 and how that slowly um morphed into what what this is and and um i i'm quite curious about that as well but snowden's relevant from there from 9 11 you get stellar wind where it's uh, the surveillance is then they're surveilling the american people and uh, i discussed this with schellenberger uh hamilton 68 group the, the Russian hoax, rather, that Russian disinformation is a reason then to start the, the justified censorship from media today or, or, or pre-Musk Twitter and, and but other, still at other social media. I'm quite interested by that story, particularly as you also reported on Flashpoint, which is, was, was originally formed to focus on infiltrating Islamic terror groups. And that group has now, been, has now morphed... Um, to surveil vaccine mandates, so have I understood that correctly? Yeah, that's right. So what's the, what, what was that specific story? Yeah, this is a, you know, I think there are many examples that show um, the growth of the Homeland Security surveillance state, and this private contractor is kind of the perfect one because it, it, it ranges the whole the gamut of, 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 of of every American who should be concerned with civil liberties and, and the kind of invasion here. This is a firm uh, founded by someone named Evan Coleman, who, um, you know, he worked with various organizations that were infiltrating mosques and Islamic communities after 9-11, gathering information. Uh, he eventually founded Flashpoint as a company that went into, you know, Al-Qaeda message boards and others. They gathered all this intel on um, 
Muslim Americans and, and Muslim uh, extremist groups, and, they would, and he would sell it back to the FBI, sell it back uh, to the Department of Defense um, as this firm grew, but the war on terror wound down, he pivoted. Hmm. Um, this is a company that now is very large. They just kind of acquired another surveillance contractor uh, last year. And, um, you know, I, I, I interviewed some of the officials there, um, pieced together kind of the, the, the public history. And this is a company that, that now it still works for the FBI. Um, it, it also works for large American corporations. And what they do now is they create fake um, identities online. Um, they infiltrate um, private online communities, whether that's on Reddit or a Discord or on WhatsApp and others. And they take this intelligence and they sell it back to their various public and private clients. And, it, and for a company that started out surveilling uh, and spying on Muslims, now they're spying on groups that are even considered um, uh, conservative, that are maybe uh, perhaps more right-leaning. The anti-vaccine. The, yeah. So one, so one of the, the you know, in, in, in the United States, we had this big debate around the vaccine mandate. Early in 2021, as the vaccines were being rolled out, various large corporations were requiring their employees to receive uh, the vaccine or otherwise they would be dismissed. And then the federal government enacted a very controversial policy um, through a through OSHA, saying that if you, if you have 100 employees or more, um, you have to be tested weekly or um, receive the vaccine or you, you, you must be dismissed from your job. Um, this policy led to thousands of people all across the country losing uh, th their job. There are there similar uh, mandates from different um, cities and states, uh, eventually found uh, unconstitutional except for one uh, carve out for healthcare workers. but. Uh, at the time, many of the leading activists against the mandate were people who worked in the transportation industry, truckers, people who worked in the airline industry. I mean, especially the airline workers. They were on the front lines. They were the most essential workers. Mm. The, many of these uh, employees were the among the first to, to be infected with COVID-19 mm. and, and recover. And these mandates had no exception for natural uh, immunity from prior infection. Um so, not, so, you know, I think very reasonably, they argued that these mandates should not apply to us. So, you know, if we had already been infected by COVID-19, why are we being forced to take this shot? Mm -hmm. um, it's essentially a labor issue, which, you know, it was once seen as a, as a left-wing issue. If, 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 if working class people, if people who are, are demanding more rights on the job from government and corporate interference... Um, there should be some sympathy from the left. They, they didn't receive received it from most left-wing groups. But the, the added kind of insult to injury here is uh, they were being actively uh, surveilled. Flashpoint um, infiltrated their private chat groups, um, were uh, spying on, on what they were doing in terms of their organizing. You know, they had regular weekly webinars. They had actions, you know, like any activist groups. Mm -hmm. um, and you had this uh, very sophisticated... Uh, government backs uh, surveillance firm gathering their their information their private information wow um, do you do you think that this stuff you know uh, your your story what happened in June 2020 at the height of the racial tension in America and this stuff of the vaccines are we was were, was it just a uh, uh, did, did America go mad, mad and are we kind of out of that now that we're post COVID, do you think? Or was it, was it a time of lunacy? And, and, uh, or, or do you think we can expect this to continue? Do you think, where do you see this stuff going? I don't know. I feel like there's um, a general uh, unease in America. It's not as extreme. That was kind of, that was perhaps the, the height of uh, extreme public policy and politics. I don't think we're going to enter that same period of riots uh, anytime soon. Mm. Uh, the level of racial anger, uh, the kind of uh, semi-authoritarian, uh, you know, squelching of speech and, and lockdowns around biosecurity measures. But I don't know. I mean, I don't think anyone predicted 2020. I might, I might answer my own question there a little yeah. bit. Was another story is that you, you, you reported on Ukrainian intelligence contacting FBI uh, to censor American journalists, which suggests that, okay, so we had race relations, then we had COVID, and now Ukraine is, is the same mechan uh, 
infrastructure at play to censor Americans continued. Yeah, I think, okay, that actually is a perfect wind up to the way I'm thinking about this now. I don't see the level of phenomenon again, but hard to predict the future, but it, it created the bureaucratic and legal and political precedent uh, for the infrastructure for more potential censorship for you know m more kind of con government and corporate control of our daily lives for shaping the discourse um january 6 actually keys into this i mean to see the fbi working with almost every uh, big internet company uh, big app company to track down americans for simple trespass mm. if we see another kind of left-wing or right-wing political phenomenon in the future. Now the FBI has a new suite of tools in their tool book mm. to, to, to track down Americans. Um, I think a lot of these, you know, if, if we didn't have the kind of hysteria around Russia in 2017, which created the Foreign Influence Task Force with the FBI, which then created this new relationship with Twitter and Facebook, which then became this censorship apparatus or you know whatever you want to call it misinformation reporting apparatus around the 2020 election and covid you know all these things leads one leads to the other and now that you have this fbi relationship with the social media companies you uh the war in ukraine just taps into that mm -hmm. so you have ukrainian intelligence officials they back in 2015 2012, they didn't have this government apparatus that they could just quickly key into. Mm -hmm. Now that this apparatus exists, um, because of this various phenomenon, um, there's a an easy kind of turnkey way for uh, intelligence agencies and other war planners to shape the public discourse mm. around the conflict in Ukraine. So for future wars, for <laughs> future elections, for future issues, this infrastructure exists and it can be exploited. So you're in London now because... Schellenberger Taibbi are here and they're doing an event with Russell Brand about this uh, censorship issue. They, or certainly Schellenberger, see, sees this as a bit of a fight back and, and obviously reporting on it is step one of the fight back. Do you think that this can be dealt with or changed? Are you hopeful? Do you think that Schellenberger's right to even bother trying? Do you think, do you think there can be a change to this surveillance and this censorship? Well, I'm, you know, I want to be optimistic and look at public polls. You know, I've written about FBI abuse of anti-war protesters, of Muslim Americans, of other kind of maybe viewed as left-wing issues for my entire career. And, you know, it, it, unfortunately, it was partisan back then. You had Democrats concerned with mm. the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and Republicans kind of shrugging their shoulders. Mm. Today, uh, we see a Republican Party and conservative and moderate and even independent Americans extremely upset at the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security and its way of, and its role in shaping the public discourse. Mm. Um, you have presidential candidates, um, you know, promising reform. You have congressional re re Republicans doing better oversight hearings um, on these kind of unaccountable law enforcement and national security agencies that I've ever seen in my, you know, in my reporting career. So we're seeing momentum uh, towards accountability. Um, and that makes me hopeful. I, you know, I, I think a lot of these, these big intractable issues, the only way you get movement is if you can find some compromise between the left and the right. Mm. So you have um, an emboldened FTC, you have a, a small number of, of journalists and activists on the left that are still concerned with these issues. And you have, um, for the very first time, a, a conservative movement, a Republican Party uh, that would like to see action. I, I, I hope that there can be some coming together uh, for reform. Great. Well, uh, Lee, uh, fascinating speaking to you. Where can listeners and viewers find your work? Uh, um on Twitter, LHFANG. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've been solo on Substack for about two months and really enjoying it. So I really appreciate the interview. That's Great. It. It's been fascinating. Li Fang, thank you for speaking.